last session for today. Um, today we're going to learn from Christine about monitoring and um, some other interesting things about metrics and stuff like that. So, Christine, thank you very much for the talk. Take it away. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Christine. I co-founded a company called Honeycomb with Charity. Um, we are trying to help usher in a new era of tools for distributed systems and customers who have high observability requirements. We initially worked at Parse, um, we met at Parse, which you can think of as a Heroku for mobile apps. Uh, she ran the infrastructure team and I built our analytics product. We were there through the Facebook acquisition, um, at which point Parse was serving about 60,000 different mobile apps who all depended on us to be their object store, user store, uh, event store. By the time she left, about, a, about six months after I did, Parse served over a million different mobile apps. Um, so our battle scars from supporting those million different apps, those million different workloads, are what inform our worldview um, and our confidence that the world today is going somewhere where without the right tools, uh, it's looking pretty dark and scary. Honeycomb, on the other hand, is working on those problems of observability for software engineers because of what we saw at Parse. Uh, and I'll tell you in this talk about how observability is different from monitoring in some very real ways. So platforms and developer APIs uh, are very near and dear to my heart. And I want to talk a little bit about what makes platforms successful. From a technical point of view, and specifically that as pertains to the observability and the quality lessons we learned at Parse, um, at Facebook, and at Honeycomb. The wonderful thing about platforms is that you have the problems of every customer added together, multiplied by co-tenancy problems and problems of scale. You have to treat them natively, um, or otherwise you're just an outsourced ops and support team. At Parse, by the time we had over a million different apps on our platform, um, what this meant is that we essentially had a different failure mode than a lot of other software companies. When you're building a consumer product, um, you have a little more leeway. Your, you can, your, your backends can fail and your clients will know how to uh, cover, cover that up or retry or, or fall back to some fake data. Um, approaches that require knowledge of your application, your use case, and what your end users expect. As a platform, as this back-end service for all these different mobile apps, uh, we, we didn't have that leeway. We had to be exact. We, and our customers relied on us to be always up, always around. And increasingly, we're seeing software, more and more software companies be a platform themselves. Whether or not you think of yourself as one, um, if you have an API, if you have people who are starting to uh, not rely on your end experience, but rely on the correctness of the results your servers are returning, um, you're also becoming a platform. And when it comes to observability, platforms have these characteristics that mean they're on the cutting edge of how we think about distributed systems and supporting them. Uh, we pulled this from a blog post, uh, the URL is at the bottom, and um, it's a great post that kind of goes into detail, but here's the gist. You need, you need to make something that people genuinely need, uh, bringing real value to their lives. An API should never feel optional, a nice to have. Uh, ideally, as a platform, this API is the core way that people are interacting with your service. What is the business model for my API? Usually long, the wrong question, um, strong APIs, are, are the way that people access your great business model. The business model and monetization also forces the conversation about who retains value where um, and what value the users of the API gain versus what values of the, the provider gains or retains. Um, roadmap, uh, communicating the roadmap to is, uh, communicating a clear roadmap to your developers um, helps your developers plan and depend on how your platform is going to grow. Uh, things like back backwards compatibility uh, are serious commitments, and you need to understand your commitments, or else you're, you're in for a world of hurt. Uh, you're, you're also building for developers, so it should be reusable, composable, flexible, as simple as possible, at the, with the right layer of abstraction. And finally, as a platform, you're the basis for other people to build on top of, so you need to be steadier, more predictable than your average software company. 
And these last two, this support and stability, means that you as a platform become understandable. What does that mean? There's no such thing as a great API with bad support, uh, because this, 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 this support means things like good API design, stability, versioning, um, a low time, a low time to first hello world, um, something that people can immediately understand how to use it, how it's supposed to behave, and again, how they can depend on it. Um, but understandability also means your own support people or your own developers being able to quickly and accurately understand and explain any behavior your users are complaining about. Um, so that's the, the external component to your internal ability to debug and diagnose any issue. So the two of these together are understandability, which is what we're talking about today. Uh, this understandability is the system where you can track down the root cause of an unknown, unknown problem. Um, a known unknown is something like, ah, oh, crap, um, MySQL is running out of, out of connections. Uh, this, is, this is probably that unicorn restart bug. Can, can someone go throttle that app or, or restart that server? Um, it doesn't mean that you, you always know uh, what to do about it, but it does mean the, the pool of possible solutions is, right, uh, is, is, no, is small, um, and you probably don't have to spend hours or days trying to understand what the problem is. You know what the problem is, there's, there's a couple of possible mitigation strategies and you do it. Uh, in general, you only have to encounter a problem once for something to become a known unknown. Um, if your engineering culture is good and you have a good post-mortem practice and you share knowledge. And we learned this the hard way at Parse. We had some amazing engineers, but by the time we were acquired, we had, we had built a system that was essentially undebuggable. Because we had so many different workloads, so many different customers, so many people writing, different, writing all these different apps, trying to do different things, um, each day we would come in and someone new would be, like, would be complaining about some new strange interaction between their code and our backends. Um, and at the time, we had a fairly traditional monitoring stack. We used Ganglia, uh, we had our time series up on our dashboard. Um, but when we got to Facebook, when we started using their tools, it changed our lives. We were able to go from taking hours or days to debug a problem or add some instrumentation, special casing a particular app and tracing it through, to it taking minutes or seconds to be able to look at any of those segments, to look at any of those apps. Um, and we realized that th that was the difference between monitoring and observability. So with monitoring, you have essentially a finite set of things that you care about, that you're watching, um, and there's an acceptable range uh, of behavior within those. So it's a little bit more straightforward to set these thresholds, set some alerts, um, make sure it's, it's doing exactly what you think. And it's also important to note that these tools tend to be ops-oriented. Um, a lot of our time series tools, um, a, lot of, a lot of things like Anglia, make it very easy to immediately get system stats, CPU, memory, disk usage, awesome. Is that going to help your developers understand what in their code is causing this customer to complain. On the other hand, observability is its a term taken from control theory, and it's this idea that um, you want this ultra-rich debugging environment. And to get that, you have to open the hood and play around with what's inside. Um, and when I say play around with what's inside, I mean play around with the internals uh, to make them report their state so that you can then understand, okay, well, this is what's going on inside. Here are the outputs. What's going on? What's, what's happening? And because of that, we associate it a little bit more with engineers, with developers, because you have these nouns that people are working with when they're writing the software themselves. For us at Parse, this was app ID. Um, for, for someone else, this might be shopping cart or user or MySQL query, something, something that is their own cause of chaos in their system. Um, and, and when I, we talk about building things for software engineers, things for developers, that's who we want to build this for. We really felt like the first wave of DevOps was uh, teaching ops people to write code, to automate. The second wave of DevOps should be teaching software developers to own their code, to own the reliability of their, of their system, because the actual ops teams are more, are more and more on the other side of an API. So, 
what happened at Parse was we had this system with metrics and dashboards. Um, and every day, a few of them would encounter something. Sometimes it was their fault. Sometimes it was ours. Um, but we, either way, we didn't have the ability to reliably track down whether, whether it was them writing bad code or something going, else going wrong in our SDKs or our backends. Um, because we only had these traditional tools, we could tell whether, whether the system was healthy. Um, and so what would happen is someone would write in, complaining, parses down, and we'd say, no, you know, all of our dashboards are green. Error rates are within, within normal bounds. Um, are you sure? Have you checked your Wi-Fi? Are you sure it's not you? And something saying, no, it's not, when your customer or, or some user of your system is telling you that your, your, your platform is misbehaving isn't useful to them. It doesn't really help them debug, especially if it's not actually your fault, if it actually ends up being your fault. And it's not useful to you because it damages your credibility, because it, it makes the customer feel like they can't trust you or your platform anymore. Honestly, the health of the system isn't relevant. You don't care about the overall health of the system. Because when you have a ton of these unknown unknowns every day, many times a day, the set of tools that you need are the things that will help you understand the health of the system from that customer's perspective, or from the perspective of a particular replica set, or the perspective of some segment of your system that you care about. Um, so when we got to Facebook, Big companies do this thing where they, they pat you on the head. They're like, oh, you're a cute startup. It's a good job you've gotten this far. And they, they hand you a bunch of tools saying, you know, this is what you should have been using all along. A lot of them were garbage. Um, a lot of them were very Facebook specific. Um, but this one called Scuba was, was, the, was the catalyst for this change in our behavior where we could suddenly throw all of our data um, as, as requests. Not something where, this was not something where we had to um, take a request, break it off into a bunch of different counters, and, and try to look at a bunch of different graphs figuring out what changed, we could take our full event, shove it into Scuba, and, and retain that context for the next time we said, hey, well, what does traffic look like for this, for this one app? OK, well, traffic looks like this. But what about traffic broken? You know, what about the distribution of operating systems that their app is running on? What about just the distribution of the app version, where we could go down and at any point actually look at the raw the actual request that was issued to understand all of the different facets of this reality that we were living in. Um, another angle on the same story, our analytics product at the time was itself based on pre-aggregated metrics. Uh, we defined a few metrics and, and allowed our app developers to break down by a small set of well-known things, HTTP verb, iOS versus Android. Um, but as we got to Facebook and as our popularity was growing, People were writing in all the time saying, hey, well, my graph has this spike in it. Um, why, why, why is there this spike? What's happening? What's causing it? Is it, is it you? Is it me? Do I just have way more users? And we had to end up falling back to our own API logs, falling back to Scuba, to answer this question for our developers. Uh, you know, well, it looks like 75% of these requests are coming from one particular device. Maybe you should look into that. That's the sort of question we never would have been able to answer with Ganglia. We never would have been able to blow out our key space by storing um, request counts for every app and then every device ID within that app. But mobile app developers are distributed system developers. Um, and we were hamstringing them by not giving them the ability to drill down into this combinatorial explosion of the different facets of their data that they have to deal with day to day. And these are table stakes requirements when you're debugging sufficiently complex distributed systems. You've got to be able to track the success or failure of a request from the client to your servers, to your database, and back. Uh, high cardinality here means data that has lots of unique values. So this means don't tell me that I can only break down my request counts by uh, HTTP verb. Tell me that I can break down my requests by app version or user or device ID, host name, Kubernetes pod, whatever. These, these things where there are many, many possible values of them, but then as a result, they are more interesting to drill into. This is, this is, this is necessary in our tools. Um, and you need to be able to retain the context that comes along with a request instead of just 
fanning out to some predefined set of counters and never being able to get back to say, well, well, what's underneath this spike? So we're not monitoring folks, or we're not monitoring anymore, folks. Um, there are no longer a finite set of things that we're watching within a well-understood set of boundaries. Uh, this is about understanding the situation when we need it. Pre-aggregation um, or aggregating on the right side of an analytics code path absolutely starts crumbling in the face of this high cardinality world. Um, we need to be moving away from unstructured text strings. Uh, logs aren't human scale anymore. They're, they're being produced at a rate that we can't possibly be using our eyeballs to read anymore. Uh, and so while they're at machine scale, we should be making them easier for machines to read, to parse, to extract interesting things out of. Uh, and sampling is how we keep that width and detail under control uh, by accepting that we don't actually need to hang on to every single log line or every single record of an HTTP request going through our servers. Instead, we know 200 OKs, they're nice to have, everything is normal, probably not that interesting. Let's keep one out of, one out of every 10, one of, out of every 100 representative requests. But let's keep every one of our er erroring requests. Let's keep every single thing, every single full request uh, when our system misbehaves in some way or, or it exceeds some threshold so that we can go back and debug it later and look under the covers to say, hey, well, what, what were the other attributes involved when, when my system did this weird thing? We need to be able to tell stories with our data to understand why that graph looks the way it did um, or why that customer's requests were failing. It's not enough to just have something that says, okay, well, it did this thing and not be able to understand why or not be able to dig in a little bit further. Event-driven systems are more exploratory, uh, more powerful, more rich, and they take the guesswork one step. They, they, they take the, the guesswork out, or they push it one step lower. Uh, they make it possible for people to learn faster and better, because they map how our brains work. Uh, they support this sort of investigation, validation flow of, hey, well, uh, something something's going something's going wrong. Is it? I have this hypothesis, let me look under this rock. Could it, could it be this? Could it be that? And even with one of the biggest, best, shiniest metrics systems at Facebook, engineers there still use phrases like phase change when describing how the internal events tool, Scuba, changed how the company worked with data. Having a few graphs that you look at all the time to tell whether your system's stable, this is fine. You know, sometimes it's useful to have things on the wall to just have in the corner of your eye. But when you start thinking, ah, I just need a few more queries, or I just need a few more breakdowns, uh, or a few more you know, versions of this and, then, and, then, and versions of that, then you end up with dashboards upon dashboards that you're scrolling through, trying to figure out, well, what, what moved around this time and what could possibly be important to look at here. Uh, and, and what you end up with is you know, hundreds or thousands of what are essentially artifacts of your past failures. These are things where uh, you've had an outage, and then in your postmortem, you sit around being like, well, what graphs could we have had to identify this sooner? Let's add that to a dashboard. And you go through enough iterations of that, enough iterations of that, and you're just scrolling through all these things that were relevant at some point in the past. Do they have anything to do with the outage you're trying to figure out now? Probably not. The fact that our modern monitoring tools that rely on pre-aggregated metrics um, still struggle with more than a couple hundred unique combinations of tags is mind-blowing. Uh, the fact that, as, as a developer, you need to know what build was this running. Hey, these, this, this, here's this line. Uh, what build was that when that ran? Um, build ID is not something that you tend to think of in the hundreds, thousands, millions, maybe. It's a monotonically increasing integer. Why can't you keep track of that? But because of that unboundedness, it is high cardinality. It is something that ultimately your time series systems are gonna, are gonna crack and break trying to track. Um, and, and again, I'm not even getting into user IDs, app IDs, the things that make platforms tricky to debug. 
And user-defined behaviors are even harder to, to debug because it's, there's no engineer in your building that did them. It's, it's the power that you gave to your users. We all have, we all have high dimensionality problems um, because we know that the way, the way the, this world of thousands and thousands of different dashboards, you just can't have, you can't have those and still have them be useful. Um, and hard problems ultimately break down to having black swan problems all the time, all day. So this is not about finding a needle in a haystack. This is about when you're debugging a problem, when you're, trying to, you're trying to tease apart why, why is this customer getting entirely timeouts when everyone else is going fine. It's about finding a needle in a stack of other needles. All you have are needles, and you just need to be tracking as much identifying information as possible about each needle and stop thinking that all you have is to talk about is the, the average needle size. So the first lesson of distributed systems and complex systems in general is that they're never truly up. Um, there's, there, it's a partially degraded state at all times. You just don't know how it's degraded and what part. And so this is a great lie I, I was referring to in my talk topic. Uh, anytime you look at a wall of dashboards and everything is green and everything is fine, something is lying to you. Uh, it just means that your tools and the graphs that you put in that dashboard aren't good enough to show you what's broken or, or aren't, aren't you know, predictive enough to know what parts of your system uh, are, are, are struggling. The, the fact that, again, dashboards are things that we humans have to construct, that we have to immortalize as something worth putting in a dashboard, is this broken cycle that eventually turns toxic. Uh, because when you get into this pattern of, well, I have so many dashboards, if I keep scrolling, it'll, it'll show me something, uh, you start to believe that if you haven't graphed it, if it's not on the dashboard, then it, there is no problem. It doesn't exist. The world is getting more complicated, and our tools need to keep up. When we were working with simpler systems, LAMP stacks, we were able to keep a lot of it in our head, get to know our, get to know our databases or, or our language of preference uh, really, really well and be able to smell the problem. Now, uh, and the sorts of problems that we're dealing with scale correspondingly. So any problem is an unknown unknown the first time you encounter it. Wow, what happened? Why? What's causing it? How, what do we do about it? After that, it's a support problem. You start quickly pattern matching problems to this library of likely solutions, uh, and you check them all in order. Oh, this thing is down. Is that because Redis is down? Yes? OK, well, why is Redis down? OK, well, is it because the process died? Uh, is it refusing connections? Oh, is it, is it, is it I deployed some config change, and it's, it's trying to start up in the wrong environment? Oh, oh, yeah? OK, great, fixed it. Once you're out of likely possible solutions, then, then you're, you're, back to, you're back to ground zero. What do, what do I do? Where, do? where do we start? How do we look? What's common across these failures? So in the future, our goal needs to be to turn these unknown unknowns into known unknowns as quickly as possible. And we have to get really good at answering these hard problems quickly. But it's not just as simple as answering questions quickly anymore. It's about having the information and the tools available to help us do the answering. It's not, it's not just a matter of having a uh, really quick lookup in this lookup table in our brains from problem to solution. When you're, when you're doing pattern matching, you're not, you're not actually asking questions. Um, you're just, again, doing this mapping from, I've seen this thing before, to this was the thing that made it better. When you had a database in your LAMP stack, when you had a web tier, um, a monolithic, a single monolithic app, uh, most of the unexplained problems tend to be in the code. So you're like, okay. Something's going wrong, let me attach a debugger, step through it, try to find it while it's happening. Unknown unknowns are a little bit more scary because you don't know, right? This world is getting more complicated. It might be in this part of the code or that part of the code or this other service a network hop away. And this is all changing and becoming untenable in a bunch of different ways. So what we're finding, again, for these unknown unknowns, you have to start from the beginning. You have to start from, okay, well, what's going on with this customer? What are their requests? Okay, well, um, 
some of the requests are failing. Let me break down by status code. Okay, well, within this customer, within the status code, um, I still see some 200, some 500. Let me break down by endpoint. Let me break down by device type. Let me try these hypotheses, hit some dead ends, back up, and restart. When your platform and one of your customers has a problem, they don't care about your aggregates. They don't care about your system health. They don't care about your wall of dashboards. They care about what they're experiencing. And you're, if, you're, if those customers aren't happy, they're going to be leaving your platform because they can't rely on it anymore. They can't understand what, uh, they, they can't understand why your system is behaving a certain way. This is also the way that you learn, right? We learn in science by coming up with our own idea of how something's gonna go wrong, finding data to support it or tell, me that we're wrong, tell us that we're wrong, and then moving on from there. But if you're just scrolling through dashboards and just, and just going, oh, you know, that line matches that line. Anytime you see an outlier, you need to be able to see that context. What does it have in common with the other outliers or the other problems in that space? And the width of an event the number of other attributes, the amount of metadata that you have, determines how much context you'll have. System stats, useful. Only about as useful as other contexts for, that, for those failures. Uh, things like, uh, if you're bumping up against your system resources on your database node, you could automatically, you know, just 10x or you know, 2x, 10x, whatever, your instance size uh, and thus your database si spend. Or you could instrument your system well enough to know well, let's look at, why, at what's taking up all the CPU on this instance. Well, it looks like we have one user taking up 90% of the write lock, and we could just throttle them to give our entire cluster breathing room. And this sort of context is what was killer for us at Parse. Um, one of the things that, that, that is implied when you don't have the ability to get this, these arbitrary slices of your, uh, of your data by the nouns that you care about, is that your request count or a customer's request count ends up correlating to their importance. So if all you're doing is looking at top level metrics um, and you're doing thousands of requests per day, you could have someone writing in doing eight requests a second being like, hey, you're totally down and, and we running the system wouldn't know. But it sucks if that customer doing eight requests a second is Disney trying you out, seeing if you're stable enough for them to move their apps onto your platform. Uh, and it sucks if all we can say is, well, sorry you're having a bad time. If you get bigger, we'll be able to tell you more about what's going on with your, what's going on with your requests. Um, the way that a lot of these hosted time series metrics vendors get around this uh, is by pre-generating a dashboard for their top 200 customers. Um, which probably works great, unless you're customer 201, in which case, you know, sorry, don't know what's going on. <sighs> Platforms, for whatever reason, have decided to build a business around supporting a bunch of folks who are intentionally and like very concretely abstracted away from the actual chaos that they're generating. They just see your platform working or not working. So all these things are changing these days, and all these things are pushing us towards this dark, scary world where millions of things can go wrong at any given time. Uh, microservices, you're taking the functionality that used to be nicely packaged in one code base, uh, you're splitting it up across the network. You're having to hop boundaries uh, of services, deploy units, and it's not enough to just attach a debugger because you need a debugger for your system. Instead of having a single database that you're super familiar with, where you can smell all the problems, you probably have a bunch of storage types. And you have to start debugging them a little bit more naively because you just don't have the time to become an expert in the five different databases you're running. Instead of, instead of just users behaving in, in very prescripted ways, uh, you have developers. And it gets worse if you, if you let them write code and upload it to your systems. Or if they're defining their own matching predicates uh, or writing their own queries. Uh, chaos in your system like this means more un unknown unknowns to debug. Uh, the more creativity and functionality you've given your users, the harder it will be to debug. Every system has its points of multi-tenancy of shared resources, um, and these are the hardest to debug. The database example I used before, super hard to debug if you don't have the ability to tease apart by things like user. Um, 
because of the shared resources, right? One user has the ability to affect the rest of them, all the rest of them. And if the, if the question is whether that customer or everyone else is more important, you know the answer. But determining whether it's that one customer uh, can be really hard to tease out. Systems have reached a level of complexity that you just can't keep in your head anymore. We can't try to anymore. So we just need better tools to help us figure out where the problem is, what's going on, what it even looks like, and then trying to dig in and, 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 and address them. And platforms feel this first, but again, everyone is moving, everyone is moving in this direction. All the technologies that are making it easier for developers to push code, own code, deploy, just means there's more moving parts for us to all worry about and keep up. So what can we do about it? Instrumenting your code. Uh, and this, this isn't something where, you know, sometimes people will be like, oh, is there just like a one-line solution so that we can, we can check this box and my developers can be happy? Um, you can start with that, but it has to be something that's constantly evolving. Um, it's okay to not have visibility into every single corner to start with. It's just, and it's frankly just not reasonable to come out the gate with everything perfectly instrumented. Um, but over time, your system should trend towards the knowable, or just should trend towards the understandable. As your code evolves, as new features are added, um, new things, new bits of instrumentation should be, continue to, to be added. Uh, and you're never done. You're never completely done adding instrumentation unless your code no longer changes and no, there are no new inputs ever, put, ever sent in. Ah. Knowing where your resources are shared, again, is the most critical, because this is where one user's performance problems can break or affect everyone else. Uh, at Parse and at Honeycomb, we have tons of this shared storage, shared compute. Uh, we always need to be able to segment by, hey, what's this one user doing? Or what's, what's, what's happening on this one node this one, for this one data set? It's important to understand your isolation model uh, because you need to be able to treat those differently from the ones you can completely isolate. We have uh, Honeycomb right now, we've got 30 Kafka partitions. We're, we're still pretty small. Um, and it's a big deal when, go, when one goes down. But different partitions hold different sets of customers. Uh, and so some partitions going down or being affected are a much bigger deal than others. Uh, for example, to use a parse example, it's, it's a much bigger deal if Disney if the cluster supporting Disney during a demo goes down versus this cluster that is holding mostly dead and or like unlikely to ever come back customers. Uh, Kafka partitions, it's, it's, again, it's a big deal if one of them goes down. It's a bigger deal if our single shared MySQL <coughs> instance goes down. Um, and it's a mm, eh, deal if uh, our Redis goes down and caches are flaky. But understanding how these rank and understanding how these impact your users, that's what's important anytime you're sharing resources. And again, I'm hammering this in. Uh, no one cares about the health of your system. They only care about it from their perspective. Switching to events and changing to the expectation that instead of relying on the answers that we had baked into the dashboards on our wall, uh, moving from there to expecting that we ask and we answer our own questions meant that we were able to break that instinct of staring at, the, staring at the wall and expecting to kind of be told what was wrong and instead being able to quickly, iteratively, iter iteratively do this manipulation of our data to get the answers that we needed. And this explorability, this open-endedness is what makes it huge for platforms that are growing. Or, growing, or just growing in complexity. Uh, because you don't know ahead of time which attributes, which users, which segments of your traffic are going to be relevant. So by storing the full event, then aggregating on the read path, we parse uh, with Scuba Honeycomb now, we have full control over what filters and groupings we care about, what matter. Also, having all of our engineers on support was a huge part of making parse the platform successful and is, is driving a huge part in what is helping Honeycomb hopefully become successful. All of the engineers know what sorts of promises we make to our end users, what they expect and where we're falling short. So it just helps relentlessly close that feedback loop. Mm, this stuff is boring. This is table stakes. All of your engineers should be doing this already. 
But this is what's interesting. This is where you can take something that you're pretty sure works, but you're not completely sure whether it works across your, uh, the, the inputs in the wild or, or the various, you know, all the, all the weird combinations of things. Um, it, to now we have these, we have all of these tools, feature flags, uh, observability tools that can hook into feature flags where you can push something that you're not totally sure about, uh, gate it behind a feature flag, then very carefully start, you know, send it to an ex one experimental customer or send it to one experimental workload uh, and still get those high level metrics that you care about but filtered by people who satisfy this feature flag. And you can crank it up more like incrementally to keep seeing this like very immediate ob obvious visibility into the impact of this questionable change. Things that you, can, that you know can go wrong or where you want to nail down some guardrails, immortalize those in unit tests. Immortalize those in integration tests, something that gets run before prod. Everything else, make sure that you have the tooling, you have the processes, you have the practices to be able to test stuff in prod and still be safe about it and still be able to learn, about, learn from it. I started off with a slide about how to build great platforms. We've already built the great platforms. We just, we need, or we've already built the great systems. Uh, it's the tools we need to build and the tools we need to use uh, to understand our platforms, understand these systems well. In the future, we're all distributed systems engineers. APIs are on the vanguard of technical development paradigms. We have a, we have a higher bar for technical excellence reliability requirements, and honesty. Uh, users are, are willing to forgive a lot if you're transparent and specific. Hey, ah, you know, someone's writing in, sorry, we see that too. It's, it, you're getting those errors because you're writing this particular type of query. It's, doing, it's causing this uh, bad behavior in our database. If you make this change, things will be better while we, while we fix the underlying issue. So we need to focus on trying to instrument so that we can answer questions in that way not just monitor for these things that we know can go wrong. It's about turning these unknown unknowns into known unknowns into support problems as quickly as possible. These problems are coming. They are not optional. And our solutions have to be able to deal with, that too, deal with them too. Thanks. I think I have time for questions. Yes, we, yeah, we have time for Great. questions. Does anybody have a question? That's not Hi. a lot. Well, I don't want to stand between you and drinks. Um, I'll be around if anyone ha wants to talk about this more. Yeah. Thank you Great. so much. Cool. Thank you for seeing. Thank you.